um, because it's a Pandora's box, the best help that you will have often is the history and the clinical examination. Please remember that all your investigations are an ancillary. And today what we will do is I will take you through the entire gamut of the history and the clinical examination. And um, subsequent classes, we'll go through investigations of an acute abdomen and how do you build up and treat, how do you manage and treat a patient with an acute abdomen. We'll just give uh, people, there are plenty of people joining. We'll start around uh, four minutes past seven. So that will give us plenty of time to finish the class. Um, Rudrajit, I think we'd be, we can start now. What do you think? Uh, yes, sir. Absolutely. Please do. Okay. Right. So good evening for people who've joined just now. The abdomen is uh, the Pandora's box. It's traditionally called the Pandora's box. And there's a reason for that. It's, you know, whenever you go through medicine as such, it's like climbing stairs, you know, you can't reach there on the top without going from the bottom. So you have to start with the history and nowhere is it more important than the abdomen because sometimes that is all only, that's the only thing that will give you an idea of what you're handling and your investigations, you will advise investigations accordingly. So the first is history, then comes the clinical examination, then you will do investigations to confirm your diagnosis. And then subsequently, you will institute appropriate treatment. And believe me, nowhere is it more important than here that you cannot miss the first rungs to your upper floor. You cannot reach the upper floor if you haven't gone through this entire gamut. And the reason for that is you know the famous story of Pandora. She wasn't supposed to open a box. And like all of us, she was very curious and she opened the box and all the ills, the gods had put all the ills into that box and they were all, you know, let loose. Um, and we'll come to this, uh, this beautiful painting somewhat later. So you see, history taking. Let's start off with pain and that's the first and most important thing. I've borrowed this from the Kansas University Medical Center and I've modified it certainly. They have a mnemonic and the mnemonic goes PQR square ST. So I've done a bit of a modification. We've put a little subscript to the T. So that's three OTP. 
and of the hours there's one hour that has a subscript r3 so what is it what provokes the pain now let's suppose you have a gastric ulcer you know inevitably you have a pa patient presenting with an upper abdominal pain now the patient says the moment i eat doctor the pain goes up so uh you need to mute your connections hello uh can you mute your connections yeah that just as a service to other people who are listening okay right so p what provokes you know you've got an upper abdominal pain and the patient says oh doctor whenever i eat the pain goes up you're going to think of a gastric ulcer whereas if you have a palliating which means basically if you eat and the pain goes down you might well have a duodenal ulcer because in a duodenal ulcer the moment you have food landing into the stomach you have production of acid and the moment chyme goes through into the duodenum you have immediate production of alkaline biliary pancreatic pancreatic juice so that the pain settles down and it comes back after an, about an hour and a half for two hours when the acid chyme uh, un uh, corrected acid chyme comes in so provoking or palliating q quantity what sort of pain is it is it the sort of pain that you know it's a nagging sort of a pain you know i wake up with the pain every morning it's not very acute but you know it's there i don't like it versus a pain which actually wakes you up from sleep so that means you're talking of a very serious quantity of pain out uh, out here so that is very important in finding out from the history what is the quality of the pain and the quality of the pain and i'll come to this later is it constant or is it colicky if it's constant has it gradually gone worse or is it stuck if it's colicky it has to have started off suddenly and in between attacks the pain can completely go away and leaving your abdomen absolutely soft what is the region you have to have a visual and we'll have that visual diagram of the abdomen you know basically as you know the abdomen is divided into segments and it's divided into segments by quite uh, some lines so let's see what those lines are so if you have an abdomen out here let's suppose if i were to draw an abdomen that's an abdomen that's the costal margin that's the pelvis that's the umbilicus we have some lines these lines are um as follows let me choose another color right you have a mid clavicular line sorry let me not do that you have a mid clavicular line going all the way down you have a transpyloric line out there which goes through the pylorus and we'll come to that later you have a transtubercular which means this is the line that goes through the tubercle of the iliac crest it's not the anterior superior iliac spine it's the tubercle of the iliac crest and there you actually have nine spots you have the right hypochondrium the left hypochondrium the epigastrium the right lumbar umbilical region the left lumbar the right hypochondrium hypochondrium and the left hypochondrium the left iliac fossa right iliac fossa and the hypo hypogastrium okay right so that is one of those li lines and the other region is you can realize that the hypochondrium is actually a very small area of the abdomen it actually has a bigger uh, ab a region below when you have the diaphragm going in so some people would rather divide it hang on sorry
into quadrants. And what are the quadrants? Sorry, that doesn't look very good. So the quadrants are out here. So some people would divide it into quadrants and the quadrants are as follows. You have a straight line through the umbilicus that way. So you have the right upper quadrant, the left upper quadrant, the right lower quadrant and the left, uh, left lower, uh, lower quadrant. So that is the region. And correspondingly, if you have a pain in the upper right quadrant, you would think of the liver, you would think of the gallbladder, you will read, think of the duodenum, you would even think of the hepatic flexure. So that is how you anticipate or assess for the region of the pain. So that is R2. You also have another R and that is the third R and I see that said that is R3. Radiation, referred pain, reposition of pain, which is migration, or you could actually have, uh, uh, we'll discuss this later. Let's suppose you have a inflammation in the pancreas and that actually goes through to the spine. So that is a radiation pain. We'll talk about the referred and reposition with some figures. So what about the severity? We've talked about the quality and the quantity. What about the severity? Is it severe enough to cause difficulty with work? Is it severe enough to be so severe that the patient cannot do anything and has to come to the hospital? Is it mild so that it's there, you know, but then work can be done? So that tells you how severe or how, what the cause is. Let's suppose you've got a gallbladder stone and the patient has occasional pain, particularly when the patient has rich food. So that's a sort of pain upper right quadrant pain, which might be referred to the right sh tip of the right shoulder. Or, but think about it, when the stone pops through into the bile duct and the patient has, and blocks not just the bile duct, but also the pancreatic duct, and the pain becomes extremely severe. So patient has to come to the hospital because now the patient has gallstone pancreatitis. So of the T, you ask three questions. Onset, is it sudden or gradual? Type, whether it's constant or it comes and goes, you know, could have that. Periods, is this the first time or, not, or noticed anything like this before? So that is something that you need to find out. So if I now, um, tell you that the gallbladder is here, Patient has an inflammation in the gallbladder, but has right shoulder tip pain. Why do you think this patient now has a right shoulder tip pain? Anyone? Because of referred pain, because uh, the dermatome is similar to that of the shoulder C3, C3 to C5. Right. Absolutely. Now, let's suppose I'm going to give you another scenario. Let's suppose the pancreas, which is shaped like that if you see it from behind, that's inflamed. And the patient has pain referred through to the spine. Okay. So that, what, what sort of a pain is that? That is radiation. The pain starts in the upper abdomen and then presents right in the back. It starts off as an agonizing pain, which starts off at a point and within a very short period of time, it goes through to the back. So the patient says, patient start, patient says, comes in and doctor, the pain started right in the upper abdomen. Then it started, then it actually moved through to the back and now I have severe pain in the back that I can't even sit or do anything else. Okay, so that is radiation of pain. Now, let's suppose if you have um, pain out here, let's take the red color. You have pain out here. And gradually, the pain out here disappears. Now you have a pain out here. So that might tell you that this is appendicitis. So why is it that the pain started out here, then right now is in the right iliac fossa? What do you think? Anyone? Okay. 
okay in the abdomen that is the colon and the appendix was here so think about it this patient is constipated in the appendix i'm going to draw the appendix large now the, what the patient has is because it's the patient is constipated the patient lands up with inspissated fecal matter it's called a fecolith it's called a fecolith which means it's a stone like structure made out of uh the feces inspissated stool so now this uh, appendix is distended don't forget that this appendix originally started at the t10 t10 and t11 dermatome so out here because the pain is of that of distension and there's no inflammation of the parietal peritoneum the pain gets referred out here to the epigastrium so that is how a patient would present pain around the epigastrium now when this inflammation when this causes inflammation and that actually spreads out what happens is the parietal peritoneum gets inflamed and parietal peritoneum is very localized to where it is so you now have pain out here so that's a classic presentation of an appendicular pain epigastric or per um, uh, uh, periambilical pain start to start off with when the inflammation when the, there's just a distension of the appendix no inflammation around once you have an inflammation of the appendix and the inflammation pets to the parietal peritoneum that is very specific pain and now you have pain in the right iliac fossa the other cause of migration and some of your examiners might be very keen is that um if say you've have a perforation a peptic perforation that's the stomach and you've got a peptic perforation out there and what happens is you've got the colon sitting out here going all the way down and in front of the colon you've got something else you've got the omentum the omentum divides the abdominal into two compartments the supracolic and the inf infracolic so now when you have inflammation when you have uh, a perforation a leak of intestinal contents it comes out here then it sometimes trickles down the side so you can also have been very severe pain starting at the top then gradually going down so that is migrating pain okay right so so that is the quality of the pain of the ab pain abdomen that's a little algorithm that we have made if you have a constant pain abdomen it could be sudden or gradual sudden as in a perforation you know patient was absolutely fine and the classic description in most textbook including bailey and love is that the patient almost drops at the spot so it's a sudden pain and there you have to look at the abdomen if it's rigid you've got a perforation on your hand it might be soft in which case the patient could have had an inflammation in the gall bladder there's only the abdomen is soft the only part that is tender and slight has slight muscle guard is a right upper quadrant it could be gradual and that is a classic description of a pancreatitis you have pain in the epigastrium which starts slowly becomes very severe and radiates through to the back i mean the classic description is something called an illimitable agony illimitable illimitable is if you look at the definition something that has no end so you know no end in sight that's the sort of pain now the pain could be colicky which means it comes and goes it could have radiation may not have radiation particularly let's suppose you've got a pain in the um left kidney for example let's find out what happens there left kidney you have a stone in the left kidney which has subsequently migrated down into the you've got a kidney out there with the ureter if i can choose another color and have a dye 
of the ureta going throughout here. So you have a classic loin to groin pain. The pain starts in the loin and then grows through to the groin. So it radiates down that way. So that is a classic loin to groin pain. And in between attacks, the abdomen becomes completely normal. Unless if you have inflammation, you have tenderness. Let's suppose you have, you, in addition to this, you have some element of pyelonephritis, infection. So the patient does have, in addition to the colicky pain, now the patient has a tender abdomen. So you see, that is how important history is in the pro whole process of examining an abdomen. Right. Let's consider vomiting. Vomiting, we've got a little mnemonic out here, COPD4Q. So if you go through content, what, how important is the content? Now let's suppose, for all intents and purposes, let's suppose you have a block out here. Hang on. You've got a block out here. You've got an esophageal block. So if you have an esophageal block, think of what the content will be. It will be essentially whatever food this patient is having and a bit of saliva that comes up. Okay, right. Now let's suppose the patient has a block in this area that's called the pylorus and you have a block in the pylorus. So let's see what happens out there. We've got a block in the pylorus. So what comes out? Now you've got saliva coming in, food coming in and gastric juice coming in. So that all collects out here and you have a vomiting of this content, which is basically all food with water and no bile. See, the, it's, the bile comes in at the second part of the duodenum. So it's non-bilious. Okay, right. Now suppose you have, instead of having a block out there, let's suppose you have a block out here. So now what you have, or even further down, so now what you have is you essentially have vomiting which might contain food but in most importantly because bile is now coming in out here that regurgitates out so now you have bilious vomiting so that tells you where the blockage is okay right so so that is how important so origin did the vomiting start before the pain or after the pain? That's very important to assess for you. You know, it might be that the pain, because of the incessant vomiting, now this patient has muscle, muscle pain. Whereas if you have, let's say, a pancreatitis and the patient is now vomiting, you can say, no, the actual problem was the pain. Now the patient is vomiting. Or you have a gallbladder colic and because of the of the uh, um, no, because of the uh, response to the automa automatic response to severe abdominal pain, the patient vomits. So you can say that this is due to um, a pain. Then you have vomiting. Whereas if the patient is vomiting, has uh, you have some patients coming in with cyclical vomiting. They vomit and they vomit and they vomit, and now you have abdominal pain. So that could very well be because of um, um, abdominal pain, because of the vomiting. Progress, so is it progressive vomiting? Let's suppose you have a blockage in the pylorus. This per per patient initially has a bit of vomiting and then gradually as the gastric outlet obstruction becomes more and more severe, now you have a situation the patient has classic description of a projectile vomiting, non-bilious vomiting, progressive projectile vomiting of old food material, watery material, and no bile. So that's how the progress is. Duration, to find out whether how, how long the vomiting has gone on. 
is it continuous? Let's suppose you've got a blockage in the intestine, then you pretty much have a continuous throbbing. Whereas if you have a problem in the gallbladder, it's only when the gallbladder is inflamed, you have a reflex vomiting uh, uh, happening. So that is not continuous. So if the duration, find out whether it's continuous. So frequency, how frequent is it is it continuous you know whenever the patient eats it's it vomits you know perhaps there's a blockage in the esophagus and the patient vom vomits every time he has has a meal versus if you have a, again if you have a gallstone sometimes you have a you know a very rich meal you go out for a you know a party you go out to attend somebody's marriage and you have all the you know goodies out there and then you start uh, having pain and then you have the vomiting so that is how you define frequency. The quality, as I said, you need to find out what is the content and the quantity. Right. Hematemesis and melina. Hematemesis is defined as vomiting of blood and melina is passage of altered blood in stool. Again, you same, have the same thing, content, origin, progress, duration, frequency, and quality and quantity. Now, what happens in a hematemesis is that you have a, a person, you know, either have, have, you know, the patient comes in with vomiting, incessant vomiting, and has a bit of tear of the esophagus, the classic mallory weiss syndrome, vomits, vomits for a time, for a long time, and then suddenly has passage of blood. Whereas if you have, let's say, a cancer of the stomach or God forbid, you have a variceal bleed, the patient comes out with profuse vomiting. And the moment you have that, you have patients coming in with shock. So that is also very important. And nowadays, what you would actually do is use a scoring system. This is called the Rockall scoring system. This is the National Institute of uh, Clinical Excellence guidelines. So the ones in white, are pre-endoscopy and post that is endoscopy. We'll handle that later when we are discussing bleeding. But the scoring is zero, one, two, and three. Age, less than 60, 60 to 79, more than 80, zero, one, and two. Shock, there's no shock. Systolic blood pressure is more than 100. Pulse less than 100, so the scoring is 1. If you have a tachycardia, despite having a normal blood pressure of over 100 systolic, but the plus, uh, pulse is over 100, that makes it grade 1, a uh, scoring 1. If you have a hypotension, the systolic blood pressure falling down, it becomes 2. And obviously, if you have a serious drop, that's 3. If the patient find out whether the patient has a comorbidity, no major comorbidity, there's zero score. If you have a cardiac failure, ischemic heart disease, and a major comorbidity, it's two. Renal failure, liver failure, disseminate malignancy, you score, you have a score of three. So now you have an endoscopy. The moment you have a mallory vice rare, no lesion defi uh, identified, and if even if you find a lesion, there's no sign of recent hemorrhage. This SRH means that no sign of recent hemorrhage or you have that is score zero if you have all the other diagnoses it's one if you have a malignancy of the gi tract it's two but if you should have a sign of recent hemorrhage if you don't have any or only a dark spot it's zero if you have blood in the upper gi tract adherent clot visible or spurting vessel, it gives you a score of two. And that all adds together. And the higher the scoring, you have to be far more ready to go in for active, aggressive interference. Right. Now we have one minefield in abdomen. It's called the dyspepsia. You could have origin, progress, duration, associated symptoms, relation to the type of food. Now, if you're asked to define indigestion, it's a condition which is characterized by upper abdominal symptoms. That may include pain or discomfort or bloating, feeling of fullness with very little intake of food. You know, trust me, chaps, this is one of the most difficult uh, 
symptoms to assess because some people will come in and tell you, oh, sir, we have acidity. And in Bengal, I mean, people who work in Bengal would re recognize this particular thing. We have ombol. And chapa ombol is something that you need to be very careful about because it could be hundreds of other things. It could be nausea, fullness after food, heartburn, regurgitation, belching, anorexia. Hang on, guys, we haven't finished. This is one of the most difficult, difficult symptoms. It could even be a headache. It could be insomnia. It could be constipation. It could even be marital discord, right? So what has been suggested is that, that the term dyspepsia is often used for many symptoms where they are not typical of a well-described disease. For example, gastro GRD, and the cause is not clear. After a cause for the symptoms has been determined, the term dyspepsia is usually dropped in favor of a more specific diagnosis. Please, Jack, remember that. I mean, if, if there's anything you need to remember, that is something that you will remember that in an examination, the term dyspepsia, you will drop the term dyspepsia in favor of a more specific diagnosis when you're given the chance. Because remember that this is a complete and horrible minefield that can make or break you during your clinical life and definitely during your examination, right? Now we come sir, to the list. So one question, sir. Indigestion yes, sure. and dyspepsia can be used interchangeably. Yes, it can. That You see, the problem because of that, you know, under the term dyspepsia is a host of things. So if you have a specific diagnosis, like let's say you've got heartburn, that is something tangible. What is heartburn? It's heartburn is because of the reflux of acid up into the esophagus because your gastro, lower gastroesophageal sphincter isn't working and it is usually symptom, the symptom you get is a, is a heaviness just behind the sternum, sometimes burning behind the sternum. And what happens is when you have a hot drink. Let's say the patient wakes up in the morning, has a cup of tea, says, my God, doctor, it just burns it with its way through just behind the sternum. So that is classic heartburn. That is far more specific than this vague term called dyspepsia. So the suggestion is, chaps, if you have somebody who has, you know, that term dyspepsia, try and find out what it means to the patient. I've had people coming in and saying, I have acidity. And I said, what do you mean by your acidity? Oh, I wake up in the morning and I have a headache. And it's almost certainly because of my acidity. Now, how are you going to define that and justify that during an examination? Okay? Particularly when you're presenting your patient. Okay? Just remember that. That while we, this is the most favored diagnosis of the symptom, is you, if you will. It is sometimes used for multitude of things. So be very careful when you use the term dyspepsia. You know, usually it means gastroesophageal reflux and fullness of the abdomen, but can mean a host of hundreds of other things. Okay? So that's why you need to be careful. Okay? Right. So now we get to the lump. If you have a lump, where did it start? How did it progress? Is the rate of increase rapid? Has there been a reduction in the size? You know, you started off with a lump. It started off um, in the upper right abdomen and now it's spread all over. So that is something and it's gradually increased. Let's suppose you have a splenomegaly. It started in the left up, upper abdomen and it's gradually, gradually increased over the period of time. So the rate of increase is slow. Whereas if you have, let's say, a, a, a sarcoma of, of, you know, or a retroperitoneal sarcoma, which started in the upper right abdomen and it's been rapidly increasing in size, that tells you what, you know, what you are thinking of. In one, you would consider a benign etiology. In another, you would consider an either usually a malignancy or it could actually be an infection. You could have a cyst in the liver which has become infected, so it's growing rapidly in size. So it could be inflammation, could be malignancy, absolutely two uh, uh, spectrums across. 
So find out the duration, find out whether it's painful or painless and with other associated symptoms are present or not. Fever, find out the range of the fever, the type, associated symptoms, chills and rigors and night sweats. If, for example, you have a fever caused by a chest infection, for example, or an abdominal infection or whatever cause, you could have a constant fever. But the classic description for fever with chills and rigors are three, basically, either malaria and two other contained cavities. What are the contained cavities? If you have infection in the urinary passage, urosepsis, that very often presents with chills and rigors. If you have infection in the biliary channel, it could be cholangitis, and that also presents with chills and rigors. The patient comes in with low-grade fever with night sweats. You're going to think of tuberculosis, isn't it? So these are the important history, and that is why you spent a very long period of time over history when you're treating the abdomen. Okay. Weight loss. This is a very important modality that tells you un accepted, unexplained weight loss is a very important fact which actually tells you that this might actually be a malignancy going on. The patient has lost weight, is a diabetic, has been on, on a crash course of diet to lose weight. That is accepted weight loss. So when does it, is it that the weight loss is significant? Weight loss makes it is significant when you have loss of 10% of body weight over a period of six months. So that is six months and 10%. So remember that that is your um, criteria of weight, you know, significant weight loss. So remember you have 10%, remember 10% and you remember over a period of six months. So you're often asked, what is the significant weight loss? And you please remember that. That is the criteria. Find out what the weight, what the appetite is. Is the appetite present? Or is the patient, does the, has, is the, has the patient gone off? You know, sometimes cancer of the stomach presents with a weird symptoms. You have a patient going off, you know, very fond of having non-vegetarian food. And then suddenly he finds that he doesn't like to have animal proteins. That's sometimes the first sign of a cancer of the stomach. Sometimes you have, if you have a lymphoma, you have specific food and that causes pruritus, itching, various flushings. So find out that is very important for your history. Right. Hematochesia. Hematochesia is blood in the stool. And you must, if you have hematochesia, find out whether there's an alteration of bowel habits. Now, there's a, one very simple algorithm. If, if you have a bleeding PR, find out whether it's painful or painless. If you have a painful bleeding PR, usually, please remember that... Hang on, sorry. Please remember that if you have a bleeding PR, I seem to not be getting my pen uh, active, no? Sorry, just a sec. Yeah, I think we managed to get it now. Always remember that if you draw the rectum and the anal gland, the anal gland finishes out here, you have the dentate line below which is stratified squamous epithelium. And remember, that is the sensitive area. So if you have pain and bleeding beer, it is almost certainly coming from here, usually. Almost always, it's coming from here. So painful bleeding, it could be painless bleeding. Like if you have bleeding from piles, you know, it could be painless bleeding. Piles coming... Pro, uh, prolapsing down and you have painless bleeding because the pain is coming because the bleeding is coming from an area above the, the dentate line. Right. So 
that tells you where the source of the bleeding is. You could also have a streaky bleed, which means you have a fissure that's a painful bleed with a fissure. You know, you have, let's You have a fissure like that. And when you have hard stool, that streaks the stool. So that is called streaking. You could have a large bleed. Let's suppose you have a piles out here, a hemorrhoidal bleed. So that can be large. And it's something called a spurious diarrhea. What is spurious diarrhea? Let's suppose you have, that's very sinister because you, let's suppose you have a cancer out here. And during the course of the night, what happens is you have little amounts of blood collecting in the rectal ampulla. And because the ampulla is very sensitive to content, you feel like passing stool. Early morning you get up, you find, you find that a large amount of mucus and blood goes through. There's no blood out there. So you have to remember that this is, can be one of the signs, one of the earlier signs of a rectal cancer. It, look at the color. If it, is it bright, okay, and or is it dark? If it's bright, there's a good possibility it might be coming from lower down. You know, rec, uh, perhaps below the segment, it might be coming from the rectal segment downwards. But if you have, let's say you have a diverticular bleed and there's a torrential bleed, that could still come out as quite red. Let's suppose that's the anal canal and the rectum. And you have the sigmoid colon out here. And you have little diverticuli out here, which then bleeds torrentially. Then you could still have this situation of having bright red blood coming, though it's coming from higher up. If, however, the bleed is slow and it's coming from somewhere down the descending colon, the bacterial content of the colon have a chance to work on it, then sometimes you have not only dark blood, but you have a very fishy, foul odor, you know, pungent odor of, of decaying fish, and that is, can, can be quite uh, significant. So you need to be careful about that. Right. So that is all about hematochesia. The other thing that is very important is to find out whether there's been a recent alteration in bowel habits whenever you have hematochesia, bleeding PR. That might be one of the earlier signs of a colonic cancer because don't forget colonic cancers on the left side sometimes most commonly cause obstruction. So this patient will come in and tell you, a, let's say a 60 year old comes and tell you, doctor, I've had some bleeding, but guess what? You know, I've always been very regular with my bowels. Surprisingly, over the last two months, I've had increasing and progressive um, difficulty. You know, I'm, I'm having constipation and I can't pass stool properly. Sometimes what happens is they come in with episodes of diarrhea with constipation. Now, how does that happen? That happens because if you can well imagine that if you have... you have a portion of the intestine out here, the sigmoid, where you have a blockage. So what happens on top is you have a blockage out here, a very narrow opening going through. On top of that, you have stool collecting. And this stool collects and becomes very liquid. And then suddenly a constipation is interfered with by having episodes of diarrhea. Sometimes you have fecal impaction. You have stool connected out here and same thing happens. The fluid collects around that and comes out as diarrhea. So remember that if you, you might have both, you might have progressive constipation. You might actually have alternate alternating alternating constipation with diarrhea. So 
find out whether you have yellowish discoloration of the urine and the tissues and combined with that, as you know, obstructive jaundice has a very famous presentation of pruritus, but obstructive jaundice will also give you a pale color of the stool. So it's a very important modality to find out whether the yellowish discoloration of urine and tissues is associated with pruritus, which is itching, or the color of the stool is pale. So what you would require to know, and you must know, is bilirubin metabolism. You must know about the types of jaundice, and you must know how to differentiate it. You must also know why is, what is the cause of the pruritus, and you must also know the color of the stool in different types of jaundice. So let's look at bilirubin metabolism. Now, you people are far more fresh. How is bilirubin formed, and where is it formed? Anyone? Okay, since we don't have anybody contributing, it's the hemoglobin which breaks down into heme and globin. And it happens in the reticular endothelial system of the spleen. Iron, which is broken down from heme, becomes ferric. Two, each molecule of transferrin grabs two molecules of ferric iron and takes it through to the bones for repeat erythropoiesis. Now, what happens to the heme? You know, the iron, that, you know, that yellowish is iron and that's been taken out. There's been a broken. So now you have Billy Verdon being formed and then Billy Rubin. Now, this is unconjugated Billy Rubin and Billy Verdon, and it can be quite toxic. And because it can be quite toxic, it is bound with something. What is it bound to? Anybody? Albumin. albumin. Great. Well done. It's bound to albumin, and now it goes through to the liver. It presents it at the sinusoidal surface. That you the you know, the bilirubin is a small little bit, but the albumin is the bigger molecule. So it gives up. The bilirubin is given up out here. And you require various types of proteins, of which the most common is known as the ligand, which is present in the, in the uh, uh, liver cell. It takes up this conjugated bilirubin. So what happens out here is that you have unconjugated, sorry, uh, you have unconjugated bilirubin being presented out here. You have, con out here in the cell, you have a process where you have glucuronidases, which conjugates the bilirubin, not just once, but twice. You have, you have two levels of conjugation. So now you have a conjugated bilirubin, but sometimes you have a problem at that site that gives rise to two syndromes, which, which will give you unconjugated bilirubinemia. So can somebody tell me what are those sy syndromes? It's the Gilbert syndrome, unconjugated bilirubinemia, and the krigler nayar syndrome. Normally, the type 1 is very virulent, and very rarely do people survive more than one year because of connectoris. And the type 2, where it's milder, and the patient survives through with jaundice, with unconjugated bilirubinemia. So now that we've had a conjugation, it has to reach the bile canaliculi. Sometimes there's a problem out here. And you have then a situation where now you have conjugated bilirubin, which should have reached out there, not reaching the biliary canaliculi. So you have two syndromes again. You, it's called the Dubin-Johnson or the Rota syndrome. Now this bilirubin now that has been formed comes to the liver and from the liver goes to the intestine. In the intestine, it is never absorbed in the upper intestine. It's only when it reaches the lower intestine that it gets acted on by uh, from the ileum to the cecum onwards. It gets acted on by a host of bacteria and degradation products called stercobilinogen or urobilinogen form. 
and these then get a, a major part 95 percent of it is reabsorbed and goes through back to the liver five of the five percent that is there a bit comes into stool and which is why you have the orange color of the stool right so if you have a blockage a blockage a mechanical blockage out there and there's no bile reaching out here you have pale stools but what happens is now you have a small bit of that of all that urobilinogen that has reached out there or the stercobilinogen that has reached out there a small amount comes back to the kidneys that's not the spleen that shouldn't have come there it should comes back to the kidneys and is excreted out in the kidneys as a result of which you have the yellowish color of your of urine as well so that is how you differentiate between different types of jaundice you have a prehepatic a hepatic and a post hepatic type of jaundice so types of bilirubin elevated you have an unconjugated bilirubin high and prehepatic both conjugated and unconjugated and hepatic because don't forget it starts off with a damage uh, hepatocyte then subsequently because of swellings of the because of the swelling of the hepatocyte you have an obstructive element added so you have both conjugated and unconjugated and post hepatic is only conjugated so why is it called direct and why is uh, com unconjugated got indirect because the test that is used is called the vandenberg test and that depends because the conjugated bilirubin is water soluble you can test it very easily but you have to work on your serum to get indirect bilirubin to be tested so which is why it's called indirect and in hepatic you have both you have both indirect and direct if you look at the urine, conjugated bilirubin is absent in prehepatic, present in hepatic, majorly present in post-hepatic. Urobilinogen, on the contrary, is present in uh, uh, prehepatic, biphasic in hepatic, but never present in post-hepatic. Bile salts are absent in prehepatic present in hepatic, but majorly present in post-hepatic, as a result of which urine is very dark in post hepatic in dark in hepatic but this is the controversy you know if you have urobilinogen that is completely colorless it's only when you have a conversion to urobilin that urine can also become dark in a prehepatic uh, uh, jaundice stool is normal to dark normal to pale in prehepatic and hepatic but post hepatic if you have a blockage of the bile duct and no bile is reaching it is pale pruritus is absent in a prehepatic can be absent or very mild in the obstructive phase in hepatic but it's very pronounced in the post hepatic so i would recommend that you take a screenshot of this um, uh, slide it's a very important modality and you're very often asked during your know, examination. Right. Hematuria. Type of clots, origin, amount, duration, progress. Now, if you have a bleeding from the kidney, what happens is the blood coagulates in the ureter and you sometimes have long cylindrical clots with passing out. And you have associated symptoms of a clot colic. Whereas if it's coming out from the... Um, I need to move that, sorry. Um, if it's coming out from the bladder, so if I draw that out for you, you have the kidney out here with the pelvis going down into the ureter and it reaches the bladder out there. So if you have a bleed from there, it's coming down out here and you can have actually have longitudinal clots whereas and when it blocks you have a clot colic whereas if the bleeding is from the bladder cystic lesion you could have a urinary bladder cancer the bleeding is you know you have passage of rounded clots now if you have bleeding from here sometimes you have you know passage of normal urine followed by a bit of blood at the end and that can that is often called terminal 
um, hematuria. Whereas if you have pro a progressive, a huge amount of bleed, that is called a durational hematuria. So terminal means that the first part of the urine is normal, then you have a, a, some amount of blood, that's called terminal hematuria. If the, if the blood is present throughout urination, it's called durational hematuria. Right. So anemia duration, find out whether the patient has blood uh, transfusion. Don't forget whether the, if the patient has had fever during the blood transfusion and the family history is very, very, very important. Past medical history, a drug history and present medications, history of drug allergy, a personal history, the social background, and the family history. Now, chaps, we had it very easy during our time. There was not, you know, in your generation, you'd be far more uh, queried, and you, it's, a, it's actually a, a very good um, a sign of advancement of medical sciences that you're going to be asked. We used to say poor social background, good social background. It was very ambiguous. But you have different scoring systems, which is only right because you can compare patients across. So we use something called the Kupusami scale. And the Kupis Kami sale was dated way back to 1976. So even we did it during our postgraduate times. I'm, you know, uh, I did my postgraduate after that, fortunately. I'm not that old. I am a bit of a dinosaur, but not that old. So we had this Kupu Swami scale in 1976, far more valid in its original description for us rather than you. The education of the head of the family was important. Occupation of the head of the family was important and total per capita family income per month, which was this. So you had a scoring system, education of the head of the family. If you had a professional degree, there was seven, graduate was six, had an intermediate diploma was five, high school was four, middle school three, primary school two, and illiterate one. The occupation of the head of the family, the scoring was if he had a professional degree, 10, semi-professional, 6, clerical shop or farm, 5, skill worker, 4, semi-skill worker, 3, unskilled worker, 2, and unemployed, 1. Now, where that has changed, because these were, you know, um, you know, for example, I thought we were very rich because during my postgraduate days, I was paid 400 rupees a month. So you can well imagine that, you know, that is has had to change. So I'm not going to read through that. So what has actually changed is the Kupuswami scale has a total, total per capita family income per month has changed. And we have used the All India Consumer Price Index to now score. So now what was originally 2000 above has obviously gone up 47,348. 23, approximately 25 to 45,000 is 10, 15 to 25 is 6, 10 to 15 is 4. These were approximate, I'm giving you the approximate values. 7 to 10 was 3, 2 to 7 was 2, and less than 3 was 1. So that is the present scoring system as it exists. Now you please write down the history. There are no marks allocated for this, but it's invaluable for referring to when you think you might have missed a point and the examiners often read it. Make headings, make it easier for the examiner, he uses it for you. Keep it tidy, no marks for handwriting, but it does not harm to make your presentation night. So you need to give a summary. You know, by now you should have a good idea what is wrong with your patient. You make a nice little pressy like this, Mr. A, a 48-year-old farmer from South 24 Parganas, please, please, please identify the patient. Please take the name. Find out what his profession is, what his age is. But important thing, never ever to forget that. So don't miss the important positives. Mention the negatives which help with your diagnosis, but don't go into a litany. A litany is when you have a religious thing and you you know, keep on repeating the same thing over and over and over again. So know this, know this, know this, know this, know this doesn't make it uh, very attractive. Now, please remember, please remember that medicine can be 
terribly inexact. So gloss over the controversial histories. Remember that you keep the history in hand so that if the examiner were to ask you, come up with it, but gloss over the controversial parts. Because, you know, if it doesn't prove anything, but it diverts your examiner's um, attention, you don't want to do that. So we go in through to general survey, which is orientation to time and space, ask the patient where the patient realizes where he or she is, what is her, her name is, nutrition and build, face, decubitus, pallor, jaundice, cyanosis, clubbing, edema, trachea, and neck node. So orientation, nutrition, and build. So we have Again, a scoring system. This is called the Karnofsky scoring system, and it graded from zero to hundred. Worse is zero. Excellent. Normal is hundred. So you have able to carry on normal activity. This is a, you know, I think you need to spend time on the Karnofsky staging and find out because we have another easier system, and I'm going to talk about that, but it's probably not a good idea to come out with that first because that is used for malignancy only. So you will need to justify a diagnosis of malignancy. So Karnofsky stage 800, 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40. When you get into the 40s, it's disabled, requires special care and assistance. At 70, up to 70, able to take care for self, unable to carry on normal activity or work. But above this, normal activity is possible. So 100 to 80, normal activity. 7 to 50, it requires assistance. 40 to 20 is disabled, very sick. And below that, 10 is moribund and 0 is dead. Right? So, so this is the easier scale. It's called the ECOG scale, but that is an oncology scale. Please remember that if you are using the scale, you have to justify a diagnosis of cancer. So again, zero, one, two, three, and four. It goes the other way. So four is the worst, you know, five, four plus is dead. So this goes the other way. So remember that it's easier to remember, but it's very vital to remember Karnofsky because you can use Karnofsky both for malignant and for benign uh, patients, whereas ECOG is just for malignancy. Right. Now, this is the other thing which is very important. And thanks to Rudrajit during this afternoon, he presented this slide. I copied it immediately after, from him. So we nowadays you are expected to come out with a bmi which is weight in kilograms divided by height in meters square and you have to remember the conversion but sometimes it's we believe in five foot eleven uh five foot ten so you need to know the conversion one inch is equal to 0 0.254 meters and one foot is equal to 0 0.304 meters. So this is the classification. Remember that the Europeans are far better built than us Asians. We have, we are petite. We won't say, uh, you know, we are uh, less than Europeans. We will use that euphemistic term. We'll say that our Asians are petite. So underweight is less than 18.5. Normal is 18.5 to approximately 25 in Europe. And you can see the range is 23 actually in Asians. So 23 to 25 is basically overweight. 25 to 29.9 is obese. More than 30 is uh, obese too. And in the Europeans, more than 40 BMI is obese free. So the, it actually corresponds to comorbid conditions, low, average, increased, moderate, severe, and very severe right here. So, facies. Now, this is the classic Hippocrates facies, which means you have you sunken eyes, pinched nose. You can see that the cheeks are sunken. These are all signs of dehydration, which is which follows perforation. So, Hippocratic facies was very characteristically described for perforation. You can have the mix, mix, you know, the hypothyroid facies where you have, uh, you know, a heavy sort of jowls with um, sort of um, lower palpable uh, swellings, and you have a double chin. 
So that is called the typical hypothyroid facies. You could have the typical moon facies of Cushing's disease, and you can have the typical facies of hepatic facies with uh, icterus, mala flush. So that tells you that you are dealing with a, a person who has um, a liver disease, a chronic liver disease, perhaps. Decubitus is also important. This patient, the classic, if you go through Bailey and Love, you'll find there's a characteristic picture of Bailey and Love sitting beside a patient with a peritonitis. And this patient will not move. It's Terribly, it's agonizing to move, so he won't move. And his abdomen wouldn't move. His respiration is purely thoracic and not abdominal. Whereas if you have a colic, a renal colic, you would find pa patients crunched up, scrunched up, you know, during the attack. And then after the attack, absolutely normal. In a rest pain, you would find patients sitting up, not sleeping, with the legs hanging down over the bed. So that is rest pain. Now, if you're looking at jaundice, the classic places to look at jaundice is the upper bulba conjunctiva, whereas pallor, you would look at the conjunctival, lower conjunctival, uh, uh, lower, uh, uh, lower um, uh, conjunctiva. Why not upper conjunctiva? Because there's a bit of a difference between upper and lower. The upper eyelid has something called a tarsal plate. So you cannot turn it over easily. It's far easier for you to see jaundice in the upper bulba. Conjunctiva, let me get another color in for the iris. No, for the iris. Whereas you would actually be looking at anemia out here, not there, because it's very difficult to turn that bit over. So you're often asked, where do you see, where do you search for jaundice? You would search for jaundice in the upper bulbar conjunctiva. You would search for it in the hard and soft palate inside of the cheek or the floor of the mouth, not the, you won't search for it on the dorsum of the tongue because it has multiple papillae and you, uh, it's not very easy to see jaundice out there. You can, where would you see pallor? You would also see it not just in the lower con uh, uh, palpable conjunctiva, you would also see it in the nail beds you could see it in the mucosa of the tongue or the lips, and you could see it in the uh, palmar creases. Cyanosis, now you have basically two types of cyanosis. You have a central cyanosis and you have a peripheral cyanosis. If the, you have a central cyanosis, you would have seen cyanosis. You'd find a bluish line around the lips and the edges of the tongue. And you would also see it in the nail beds, where you would also actually see it in peripheral. In a peripheral cyanosis, with, let's suppose the patient is exposed to severe cold, you would find cyanosis in the peripheries, but you will not find it in uh, the central areas. Clubbing. The classic description is the diamond sign, and you should know, and I'm sure you know the diamond sign. You hold up the, both your nail beds together, if that's one nail bed and that's clubbing is present and you have a swelling out here, that's the, uh, let's draw it with some other color. You've got, that's the nail bed out here and you have the other nail bed. You have a diamond shaped gap between both the nail beds. Okay. If you hold it up, you'll find that if you don't have clubbing, if you hold up two fingers, the end of the nail where it starts out from the German envelope, meet each other. Whereas if you have clubbing, there's a gap, there's a triangular gap between uh, both these uh, nail beds. Edema, usually pedal edema, press for some time, lift up your hand, and you find that it takes a fair bit of time, takes about half a minute for the, the gap to fill up. 
if you have a patient who's lying down, the examiners are fond of asking, where would you see that edema? And there you see it presacral around the skin over the sacrum. Trachea, find out whether this trachea is central and you have a look at the neck nodes. And this is the classic neck node. It's it's a node which is situated at the junction in between the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid during examination of the neck. And it's called, that's the node, and it's called the virtuous node or the troisius sign or the central node. And you often ask, well, how does it reach out there? Now, do we have somebody who, who can volunteer? We're reaching the end of my presentation. How does an abdominal malignancy reach out there? Virtuous node is characteristic of metastasis to the lymph node in the neck. Okay, you have something called the cisterna chile. Most abdominal metastases, the lymphatics actually come, all the abdominal lymphatics come to the cisterna chile and it ascends up in a track in the posterior mediastinum, crosses over to the other side at the fourth thoracic vertebra, goes across, becomes a thoracic duct, and drains into the junction between the left subclavian and the internal jugular. So if you have a metastasis out there and it blocks up out, blocks that thoracic duct, by reflux, it forms a lymph node out here. So that is your troisia, the virtuous lymph node. Now, Virtue was a great chap. He lent his name he was a he was a german doctor anthropologist pathologist he was also a historian he was a politician a biologist known for his advancement of public health i'm glad you don't have to remember all that he described he's lent his name right left and center he actually had about 14 things of which we remember two the virtuous gland Okay, I would recommend that you don't try and remember all 14 unless you are a student of uh, history. And he, so virtuous gland was what he said, and he described also the virtuous triad, the classic factors which precipitate venous thrombus formation, trauma, stasis, and hypercoagulability. Okay, so these are the two virtuous things that we remember. So if you have a case, you inspect from the foot end, you expect tangentially, get down on your knees, because one of my examiners used to say that at least you can always pray that you will pass the examination. So inspect standing beside the patient. So from the foot end, go to the side, get down tangentially, because if you don't have, get down tangentially, sometimes it's less, you cannot appreciate a swelling and particularly a pulsatile swelling that suppose you have an aneurysm and you can't see it from uh, looking at the patient from the top. And you expect standing beside the patient. You must expose from the mid chest to the mid thigh. You must have examined the whole region, including the hernial orifices and the scrotum. You could expose the patient from the mid to the lower, to lower chest to the symphysis during a discussion for patient comfort and modesty, but you must mention that you've expand, exposed and examined completely. It is indefensible to miss a hernia or a testicle absence or a tumor in a, in a patient. I remember that during one of during my fellowship FRCS examinations, I had a patient with a lump in the right iliac fossa, and when I when the examiner took me out there, I. I, I took the consent of the patient and I brought the clothes down to see the testes. He just tapped me on the back and said, let's go, You've, uh, I'm perfectly comfortable. You've done all I needed to see in this patient. Okay, so that is how important it is not to miss a hernia or a testicle absence or a tumor. Look at the skin, scars, tries, dilated veins, rashes, Echymosis, look at the umbilicus, which is situated in the middle, stretched side to side. Look at the contour of the abdomen, whether it's flat, rounded, protuberant, or scaphoid, symmetric, asymmetric, organomaling. Look at the movements, respiratory, whether the patient's abdomen is not moving in peritonitis. Look at the peristaltic uh, uh, movements out there. Look for pulsatile swellings. 
and look at four independent swellings. So have a look out here. You'll notice that this patient, if you look carefully, you'll notice that the right side is filling up. Can you see that? It's not immediately appreciable out there, but if you now go to Anjashtali and have a look, you will now see that this patient has a swelling which is forming out here. Can you see that swelling forming? So this is classic. It's almost like a ball, a rounded ball is moving from there to there. And this is classically called a cannonball peristalsis. And it's characteristically found where you have a particular condition. Who's going to tell me what that condition is? Anyone? Okay. Let's suppose you have a huge gastric outlet obstruction. So now you see that that is what was moving from here to there. Right. A gastric outlet obstruction. So that tells you that this you have a gastric outlet obstruction. Right. You have umbilical nodules and the characteristic thing, this is called Sister Mary Joseph's nodule. It was actually a lady called Julia Dempsey. She took the calling and after taking the calling, she was known as Sister Mary Joseph. She worked as a surgical assistant to a famous surgeon called William Mayo. However, it was not until 1949, 10 years after her death, that Sir Hamilton Bailey used the term in his textbook, Physical Science and Clinical Surgery. So she contributed to the sign. It's called Sister Mary Joseph's Nodule. Now you have the contour of the abdomen. And, we, and you know, we surgeons are very fond of, uh, we are, you know, basically where everybody's fond, of, most surgeons are fond of eating. And being gourmet, we actually describe this patient accordingly. Now you have, let's suppose if you have a, hang on, I need to get this out. You have, let's say, an you have an ovarian cyst. You have a central swelling of the abdomen. The flanks are not so swollen. So that is called a poached egg. Whereas if you have a swelling which is all the way around even the flanks uh, a boiled egg picture so here you would think of ascites here you would think of an ovarian swelling so if you see this i'm sorry i shouldn't have drawn it better so let's suppose you have a swelling you know that i need to draw it better Anyway, I can't get it there. So you have basically a swelling extending from all the way around out here. Right. That's called a poached egg because it spreads. The poached egg spreads. And if you have a swelling in the center, and I'm sure I can use that. Um, cursor now. Yeah, sort of. You have a swelling because of a large ovarian cyst. You have a central swelling and you can notice that the umbilicus has been pushed out. That's called a boiled egg contour. Right. Now, I told you that we are going to come back to this. You can see that actually the right and the left hypochondrium are very small because of this area. But if you consider and you draw the actual diaphragm, you still have a fair bit out there. So that's a transpyloric plane, that's a transtuberal plane, and the two mid axillary line planes. So wherever you have a swelling, describe where you have a three dimensional picture site, size, shape, surface, and pulsatility. That is something that you need to know. Your, that is the transpyloric plane. And one of the famous questions is what are the structures of the transpyloric plane? So this is what it is. You have the tips of both night costal cartilage. You have the lower border of L1 vertebra. You have the pylorus of the stomach. You have the fundus of the gallbladder. You have the hilum of both kidneys, origin of the superior mesenteric artery, 
lower end of the spinal cord and the cisterna chile. So this is something that most examiners are very fond of asking you, please remember that. Okay, so patient must be comfortable. Look at the patient's face, do not hurt him. Warm your hands, flat on the abdomen. Abdomen muscles must be relaxed. Now there's an issue, some people would prefer the legs out straight, some people support bent knees, whatever it is. Remember that there are two T's, temperature, tenderness and temperature. Four S's, sight, size, shape, surface. Three C's, consistency, compressibility and compartment. 1P, which is pulsatility. Whenever you have a pulsatility, you find out whether the pulsation is expansile or transmitted. Right. So the four organs, solid organs in the abdomen are the liver with or without the gallbladder, the spleen, the right kidney and the left kidney. So you feel for the liver. You start off with your hand in the right iliac fossa and gradually move your way up, asking the patient to take deep breaths. Now, if you feel the liver, it is mandatory to find the upper border. And to find the upper border, you do a percussion. You start off at the mid axillary line from the top, but you gradually move laterally to avoid the bunching up of the costal cartilages. You move slightly laterally, uh, sort of, if I can show you, that's the direction you move in your percussion. And it's normally at the, you find the upper border at the fifth, because the other question you might be asked is, is it visceroptosis, which means has the liver dropped down or is it an enlargement? So you have to define the liver's plan, uh, span. You can also feel for the spleen and to feel for the spleen, uh, let's start off with the kidney. You feel for the kidney. You feel the kidney on the right side with your left hand behind and the right hand in front. If the kidney is, is moderately swollen, sometimes you do something called a belotment. You push the kidney from behind and it hits your upper hand and then drops away. If you're palpating on the other hand, other side, your right hand is your palpating hand. So it must be anteriorly. The left hand goes behind irrespective of whether it's a right kidney or the left kidney. If it's a left kidney, you push it up. If it's moderately enlarged, it comes up, hits your um, a, a right hand then falls back. Bimanually palpable means that the kidney is huge and you can feel it. There you cannot elicit ballot, ballotment. Ballotment means that this kidney is not huge. For the spleen, you would actually start in the right iliac fossa and move up and upwards and towards the left costal margin and feeling all the way. Sometimes you might actually put in a hand behind out here to make the skin slightly soft so that you can dig your finger in below the costal margin while you ask the patient to take a deep breath and feel it. Remember always that the liver plus minus gallbladder and the spleen are related to the diaphragm. So it moves up and down with respiration. Kidney moves very slightly and if it's not related to the liver or the spleen, you have no movement on respiration, right? You need to do a percussion. Uh, you can, as I said, you need to do a percussion of the upper border of the liver. There's something called a piano percussion. If you have, a, uh, let's say, a subphrenic abscess. So if you have a subphrenic abscess, what you do have is... Let me get the pen out. You have the lungs on that side. Let me choose another color. You have below the diaphragm, you have inflammation. You have a collection of pus and air. And once the liver finishes, you have air in the abdomen. So if you start percussing, you get the resonant note of the stomach out here, of, of the lung out here. Then you have a dull area because of the inflammation. The costophrenic angle is blunt and you've got a bit of fluid collecting out there. So that is dull. Come down out here, it is resonant. Come down out here, you get the liver, which is dull again. And down here, it's tympanatic again. So resonant, 
dull, tympanetic, dull, tympanetic. So like the piano, you have white and dark keys. So this is why it's called piano percussion. This actually dates back to the time that we didn't have a lot of investigations. Right. If this is just a hint, if you have a spenomegaly that always dilate, uh, expands along the ninth and 10th rib. So one of the, the back calculation is if you percuss along the ninth, 10th and 11th rib and it is dull, think spleen. So don't miss a spleen then. So you percuss all over the abdomen, particularly the flanks and the most common test is to elicit the sign of shifting dullness. And what you do then is you, per, you ensure first that the patient has passed urine. And having done that, you percuss from the top to down. You come back to the area where there's maximum resonance. And then you percuss to the sides. And you mark out the area of dullness. Remember, it's a sign of shifting dullness, not a sign of shifting resonance. So that area is dull. So now you have the patient on the, and you also mark it out on the other side, sorry. You mark it out on the other side as well. So now you turn the patient to the side and you now describe that while the patient had a dullness out he here and a dullness out there, now that you turn the patient over, the area of dullness has shifted from here to there. So that is the sign of shifting dullness. You demonstrate that this which is, was dull has now resonant and the dullness is out here. So. Now you've demonstrated that this dullness, which was here, has shifted out there. So that is a sign of shifting dullness. There's something else that you also need to be able to realize that where you have a gastric outlet obstruction, do something called an osculto percussion. And an osculto percussion, you percuss, you put your stethoscope bell out here and you percuss all the way down. So you can actually define the outer border and you show uh, that the outer uh, the lower, the greater curve of the stomach is all the way down out there, right? So that is osculto percussion. Right, auscultation, you have a brui over a vascular tumor or an aneurysm. You have to find out whether it corresponds with the pulse. Increase or decrease bowel sounds. If you have a blockage, you have an increased bowel sounds. Where you have eyeless, you have decreased or absent bowel sounds. You sometimes get a venous hum because uh, if there's a blockage in the portal, so particularly if you have an extra hepatic portal venous blockage, you have um, collaterals traveling along the fanciform ligament, and that can sometimes give you a venous hum. So you need to remember that. You need to do a rectal examination or a vaginal, vaginal examination in your real life. In an examination, you need to tell the examiners that you would have done a rectal examination and vaginal examination. Why? Because the pelvic deposits presents as a hard shelf and it's called a plumber's shelf or a schnitzler's metastases. And the characteristic description in a female, in a lady who's of ear, um, Childbearing age, if you have, if she has a tumor, particularly a mucus, mucinous tumor of the stomach, classic description, you sometimes have spreads to the ovary and you have large ovaries, which are called Krukenberg's tumor. So one of the precepts is we now have queried whether it's a transylomic spread, but Krukenberg tumors do happen, do happen to ladies of childbearing age because the blood supply to the ovary needs to be there to sustain the growth of a tumor. If you have a postmenopausal lady, then you would actually have pelvic deposits and you'd have the plumber ship rather than a, a Krukenberg's tumor. Right. Compartment. We need to find out which compartment the patient has a swelling in. Is it in the parietes? Is it in intra-abdominal or is it retroperitoneal? Now to do that, 
you do a leg raising or a head raising test and if it's parietal it would become more prominent if it is intra-abdominal if it's per, if it's parietal it will become more prominent if it's intra-abdominal or retroperitoneal it would make it less prominent and you would have a less prominent swelling when you live ask the patient to raise the head or raise his or her legs so you can differentiate between a parietal versus vs intra-abdominal and retroperitoneal now the classic description to distinguish between an intraperitoneal VS, a retroperitoneal was the knee elbow position. Now we find that uh, in modern age, a bit uh, embarrassing and uncomfortable for the patient. So what we would actually do is by and large, we've stopped doing that test. It's a strict no-no as a matter of fact because it's a strict no-no we do something called a tilt test you shift the patient from side to side if it's a drug abdominal you might find that the swelling moves left when the patient goes on to a left lateral position goes on to the right it's a right lateral position whereas if the lesion is actually hang on i need to um Let me choose that color. Sorry, I'll get there in just a moment. Okay, so now that's the peritoneum and you have a lump there that's retroperitoneal with a tilt test that doesn't move intra-abdominal lumps even if it's fixed it moves slightly if it's parietal it has become prominent when the patient raised the head or the feet so that's parietal that's intra-abdominal and that's retroperitoneal so you see guys i mean Doing a clinical examination is vital in the abdomen. Once you have that, you can then go across and do all your investigations because your investigations will be guided by your clinical findings. So, guys, that's my last slide. And just remember that when Pandora opened the box, everything escaped. All the ills of the world escaped but something was left behind. Full marks to whoever can tell me what was left behind. Can somebody help me out? Hope, what sir. was left behind? Hope. In case you don't know, hope. what was left hope. behind was this. It was hope. So I'm Real hoping sides. that you would actually work on your history and your clinical examination. And if you do that, abdomen is, makes, it, it makes abdominal diagnosis a lot lot easier right Rudhajit I think we've done that class we've finished any questions sir uh, regarding uh, this hello Hello. Any questions, anyone? Yes, sir. sir. Hello. Hello. So if you don't have any Hello. questions, you might want to put in a chat, you know, put it in the chat. There's... Hello. Uh, we have one question. There's, is there any way to assess clinically the transpyloric line in the patient? Yes, you find out what is the tip of the ninth costal cartilage, Srijan. Um, and uh, if you draw a line between the two tips of the two ninth costal cartilage, you get your transpyloric line. Bully, you asked about treetop mobility. Um, I need to share my screen. 
if I can share a whiteboard, would be better. Yeah, okay. What treetop mobility is, is as follows. Let me draw the abdomen first. So let's suppose you have the abdomen. That's the peritoneum. Uh, say we have a lesion. That's the colon. And you have a lesion from the colon. So let me draw the lesion like that. Right. Now what you have below Bully is the transverse mesocolon. Okay. So mobility for this particular lesion would be like the treetop. Can I? That's somewhat like a tree. So if you think about it, when you have, we had the Amphan out here, you have various trees uprooted and that was because that was the mobility that was there. Out here, you have the same sort of mobility and that's called a treetop mobility. Okay, it's not freely mobile, but that's the treetop mobility versus if you had, let's say, a you had, let's say, a mesenteric cyst. Now that would move in both directions, that way and that way. Okay, that's freely mobile. This was, this is treetop mobility. Thank you, sir. Appendicular pain, okay. So, chaps, don't mind. I'm going to draw that whiteboard once again. So, for a start, let's draw the abdomen. I'm going to use black now. Or the abdomen out here and now I'm going to fill in the colon with the appendix. I'm going to draw it a bit big. That's the ileum, ileocecal junction. That's the colon going all the way out here. Now think of where the appendix started in a child when we were inside the mother's womb. The intestine actually started here, which later moved in, leaving the last vital intestine duct. It just moved in. So the origin of the intestine was approximately, let's say, T10, T11. Okay, right. Now you have an, uh, let's say, let me choose this color. You have constipation and you develop, this patient develops a fecolith. Now what happens if when the patient develops a fecolith is that there's distension of the appendix, becomes larger, but it's not inflamed. So the pain actually radiates through, but referred, you know, the pain starts off where? Pain starts off at its source because it's an ill-defined pain. It's an ill-defined pain due to the distension. So it's referred back to which area? It's referred back to the area which is supplied, you know, rather like uh, uh, you describe the um, uh, gallbladder pain. So it's referred to that area out here. So it's the pain starts in the epigastrium or, you know, a bit of a supramalical region. Now, next stage, what happens is over a period of time, over some hours, that inflammation now spreads. The inflammation now spreads to the, where does it spread? Hang on, if I, 
if I draw that abdomen once again, remember I drew that abdomen. Hang on. So you, this was the appendix, uh, the cecum, and this was the appendix. Now that is a parietal peritoneum. Parietal peritoneum has the same sort of dermatome out here. Now when you have inflammation spreading out, out here, it affects this part of the parietal peritoneum. So now the pain which was originally out here now comes through to the right iliac fossa. Okay, so you have pain in the right iliac fossa which was originally started off in the epigastrium or around the umbilical region. Okay. Now I have to stop sharing to see the questions. Well, traditionally, after you ask whether the pain during a CVD wound can be called colicky, I grant you that the uh, because the bile duct doesn't have a huge amount of uh, muscle, it shouldn't be called colicky. But traditionally, you know what? We have uh, throughout the ages.